Why do you say that, Father? You aren't afraid, are you? No. But I respect some of the superstitions of others. Often, they are founded in fact. Broadcasting from our Sanctum Sanctorum in Venice, California, I'm Krista. I'm Kristen. And we are the Sixth Sixth Sense Society. Society. Welcome to another episode of the Sixth Sense Society. Tonight we are going to be talking about animal totems. But first, let's go over a little of the cosmic weather for the week of December 2nd. Tonight we have a waning crescent in the sign of Libra, so you Librans will be happy with that. And we are going into the descent before the new moon, which will be Thursday, December 6th. It will be in 15 degrees of Sagittarius in seven minutes. It's going to be 11.20 p.m. Pacific time, but that makes it the next day on Eastern time. So check your ephemerises for your Eastern people. And then Friday, guess what, people? December 7th, we have Mercury going direct. It will be roughly in 27 degrees of Sagittarius. So that will give us a little relief from the retrogrades. <laughs> oh, my God. Like the, the retrograde roundup, the year of the retrogrades. Yes, and you had something to add tonight. I did. You know, I actually want to talk a little bit about Capricorn and Saturn. And you're all like, what? That happened a year ago. (laughs) Um, It did. It happened a year ago um, in December. So it's been a full year. And as a lot of you know, um, Saturn uh, does a transit and it's about, it's two and a half and change years. So it's going to take us into 2020. And um, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about Saturn and Capricorn, because I know a lot of people are like, they don't like Saturn. It kind of gets a little bit of a bad rap. Sure. Because it's kind of like father time. And it kind of, it forces us to really kind of stop sometimes. Like, wait a second, no, take a little bit of a second look at that. Or no, you can't, sometimes you feel blocked. Often the Saturn return um, can feel a little bit, like I know mine was sort of like a lot of a lot of things happened and, and I felt like I was constantly being black, blocked and having to reevaluate. I have a really good friend who's a Sagittarius and she's going into her Saturn return, but oh. Jupiter is in Saturn, as I'm so sorry, Jupiter is in Sagittarius yes. wanting to expand and uh, Saturn is in um, Capricorn wanting to kind of say, okay, slow down, wait a minute, maybe look at that or even no. Saturn sometimes can even say no. And so it'll be very interesting for those of you who are going through your Saturn uh, return and you're also uh, a Sagittarius. So happy birthday, by the way, because your birthday's coming up very soon. But anyway, um, when Capricorn first met Saturn, a lot of people were talking about the three-year plan. And I think it's a, because Capricorn is in its home of Saturn. It was a, it's a really great opportunity over these two and a half to three years, really, to kind of over the look at your life. What do I want to accomplish long term? Because anything that you're kind of willing to slow and steady wins the race. In under under this transit, you have a really great opportunity to really, if you're willing to slow down, if you're willing to kind of like, okay, I'm getting a no or I'm getting an obstacle. What else can I do? What else is my perspective? How can I look at this? Structure doesn't have to be bad. If you're willing to kind of go with the flow with it, if you're willing to kind of look at it. Um, And I just wanted to remind you a little bit about that. Because if you kind of didn't know about it or you got skipped over or you just forgot, because let's face it, there's tons of astrology. Like every single week there's another astrologer yeah. talking about something else going on. <laughs> and it's really easy to kind of like, not unless it's close to you for some reason, it's it's easy, easy to forget these transits. Because they're just part of our lives and obviously you can't go crazy over everything. But I did want to bring us back a little bit to your three-year plan. Maybe you don't have one. It's not too late. It's still six weeks before the end of the year. And there's plenty of time to look back at this last year. What has Saturn kind of said no to? What blocks have you had? What things have been you've been forced to look at in a new perspective? What things have you wanted to do but just couldn't accomplish for some reason? Was it a blessing in disguise? Was it a relationship where it was sort of like, you know, uh, rejection is um, God's protection kind of thing? <laughs> like it, it can be. It can be a lot. Something that I really want to share with you because I this really um, uh, when I when I saw this I was like that is so Saturn in Capricorn 
So last year, Frances McDormand, and I'm looking at my iPhone because I want to, I'm going to read something to you in a second. Frances McDormand won an Oscar and she got up and she said, inclusion writer. And like everybody went like, what the hell is she talking about? What is an inclusion writer? How do you spell writer? Is it R-I? Is it W? Is it, what is she talking about? And I'm going to read this to you and why this is important to Saturn and Capricorn. An inclusion writer is a clause in an actor's contract that requires the cast and crew be diverse in order to retain the actor. An inclusion writer is something actors put in their contracts to ensure gender and racial equality in hiring on movie sets. Mm -hmm. So what she was kind of saying was we can use this to force diversity, mm. but it's a clause, it's structure, it's a legal thing, but it's a legal thing. It is something that is structured that is for the good, right? So again, structure mm. doesn't have to be bad. And I remember just thinking that is the perfect example of yeah. how Capricorn and Saturn and the three-year plan and taking our time and slow and steady wins the race can really be a good thing sometimes, even if we're feeling things are kind of getting slow. How come I'm being blocked? I did a, a 15 minute reading for a client at an event that I was doing for free, for free for a friend because she wanted a tarot card reader. And the girl was like so upset because she wanted to, she was a lawyer and she wanted to work in charity and she didn't know how to get there. And I was literally seeing her eventually kind of like getting out of it. But I said, you know, this is, Saturn had just gone into Capricorn. I said, you know, I think this is like a long-term plan to it. Ugh! I can't even imagine. I said, this is a perfect time to manifest a Saturn and Capricorn, your three-year plan. I don't want to do a three-year plan. Ugh, I want to do it now. I want to get out of being a lawyer. I can't stand it anymore. I want to work for charities and I want to do help humanity. And I kind of said, well, you're a lawyer. Maybe there's something you can do to help humanity with the law. Maybe you could volunteer and help people with immigration that can't afford a lawyer and need to stay in America somehow. Maybe there's something that you can do. Go to a charity and say, hey, um, I'm a lawyer, I'm, I'm interested in getting out of law, I'm interested in doing this, but this is what I have to offer you right now, using the skills she has to build on. So this is just sort of my uh, free kind of thought a little bit about now that Saturn has been in Capricorn for one year. These are just my thoughts and opinions. Um, I'm not a professional astrologer. I'm a amateur lover of astrology and uh you know as are many people as are many people <laughs> and i really just wanted to i wanted to say something a little bit about that and it's not too late and it's a so if you're feeling these blocks it's it's not it doesn't have to be a bad thing there are things this year that i was like why didn't this this and this and this work out and oh my god and you kind of really do have to think this is a good time to embrace um, taking it slow, going with the flow, and not being afraid to use structure. So if you're not someone that has a lot of structure in your life and structure feels uncomfortable for you, maybe you if this is some a time to find a way to add a little bit of structure. Because again, inclusion writer, that's structure, right? But that's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. So I'm going to add, I, that's really wonderful points. And um, I personally am going to be going into my second Saturn return, which is in Capricorn. And I have Jupiter and oh, Sagittarius. Wow. Oh, um, fantastic. So what's interesting, I remember, I wish I could remember the astrologer that what, said that the depression of Saturn, you know, it's a real, it was a really good astrologer. I'm so sorry. I don't remember who it is. But um, when the depression of Saturn will lift, when you become disciplined about mm -hmm. whatever area it is. And that really struck home for me, that idea, mm -hmm. not just of limitation, which is true with Saturn, it wants to be a little more realistic, but the idea of discipline. And so your Saturn return, whether it's the first one, second, or some people are having third ones now, mm -hmm. lifespan, mm -hmm. you know, right? It, it is about discipline, it seems like. Um, and then the other thing is people that have Aquarius uh, rising, again, which I have, you will be ruled by Saturn. And this mm -hmm. is a topic I would love to have an astrologer on about rulership and mm -hmm. what it really means to be ruled by a planet. Because it's, yeah. it is a big deal, but sometimes I don't quite get it. Right. I mean, I get it in my own way, but I feel like I'm missing some points. So these right. are great points, Kristen. I think it's a really good that you brought up Saturn and Capricorn. And, you know, just because it's a year later, it doesn't have any less effect. <laughs> and so thank you for that. Uh, I think Michael has a really cool uh, news story today that goes along with our show. So take it away, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I like to look for things that sort of tie into the show. And I was, of course, looking for totems. And then I ran across this really cool um, history of the totem pole. 
And, and so I hadn't really thought of that so much in connection with totem animals, but certainly it does apply. And of course, the history was about how they became synonymous with Canada, so that made me even more interested in it since I, I'm Canadian, obviously. Um, so basically, according to the article in 1910, early 1900s, there were only a handful of totem poles on the West Coast, and they were only accessible by water, so you'd have to take a boat a couple of days in order to see them. Um, and there were just a, a few. Um, there were three basic types. There was a thing called a host pole. Now, a host pole would have your spirit animals on it. It would have your family crest or your clan crest. And they were inside the home. They kind of supported the beams inside the home. There was another type called a monumental pole, and that was found outside the home near the entrance and would often form an archway over the entrance uh, of the, the home. And that also would have your, your same you know, spirit animals and so forth on it. And then there was one called a mortuary pole, and that was to commemorate a loved one who had passed away. And again, similar in design, but often it would actually contain the actual ashes of the deceased. They would actually incorporate that right into the pole. So basically those three types of poles. Um, and carving them was done by hand with hand tools. It would take you know, several years to actually carve one of them. Um, and then they were erected in this ceremony called a potlatch ceremony, which uh, many people may have heard of. As we know, in, in the early, late 18, early 1900s, um, the Indian Act was passed, which basically outlawed Indian culture. Um, so they were not allowed to have potlatch ceremonies. They were not allowed to speak their own language. Um, and they were basically trying to civilize the savages, you know, according to the Canadian government. It happened here in the U.S. too. It was a barbaric law that, that really hurt a lot of people. Uh, a lot of the natives were put in residential schools where they were abused, and it was a, a really sad part of our history. Um, so during this time, of course, you know, um, even the Prime Minister King in Canada referred to natives as barbaric. And so all of these things were outlawed, including the building of totem poles. So for decades, literally, nobody carved a totem pole in Canada. Um, then along comes the Grand Trunk Pacific Railroad, which later became the Canadian National. And early on, they were struggling. They were trying to avoid bankruptcy. And they were trying to compete with the Canadian Pacific. And their tracks just happened to run along the Skeena River uh, through one of the communities that had the only remaining collection of totem poles. So they thought, well, this is a cool mm -hmm. thing, and maybe we can get tourists interested in taking a train ride if we emphasize this chance to see these totem poles. So it became mm -hmm. a part of their advertising. Mm -hmm. And what they actually did is they invited artists to ride for free on the train, provided that they would paint the scenery that the railroad <laughs> asked them to paint, which was important, which often included the totem poles. So, <laughs> so these artists started you know, drawing them in their, their paintings. Um, eventually, along comes this guy. Uh, well, they became very popular with tourists, so unfortunately then cities decided they liked them and they started stealing them from the native communities and erecting them in Seattle and places like that. And occasionally they would buy them, but sometimes they'd actually come in and actually just literally steal them Aww. from the natives. You know, it was really, quite, again, not a, not a nice thing that they did. Um, anyway, eventually this ar ar anthropologist at the National Museum, Marius Barbeau, um, he believed that the native culture was going to become extinct, and he was very concerned about that, and he wanted to preserve it in some way. So he convinced this Jasper Tea Room at the Chateau Laurier Hotel in Ottawa to redecorate using a native motif, including totem poles, and they agreed. Um, the decoration was actually done by a man named Edwin Holgate, who was a member of the Group of Seven, the famous artists from Canada. Um, and he did it with murals. He had, again, these totem poles installed. Um, and the prime minister, you know, at the time, King again, actually said that it was horrible what he'd done and that Holgate should face eternal damnation for allowing these barbaric things in this civilized, you know, hotel in, in Ottawa. So that was the attitude at the time. Um, but it was very popular again. Tourists loved it. So it actually created this little industry where people started carving these little miniature totem poles for the tourist trade. And, and so that went on for quite some time. Uh, in 1927, the 60th anniversary of Confederation, Barbeau again organized a traveling exhibition, which included some of the totem poles, and went around to various cities, you know, Toronto and Montreal and so forth. Um, and one of the people who saw it was this unknown artist named Emily Carr, and she oh. would go on to become incredibly famous. And a lot of her paintings actually featured totem poles. She was very inspired by it. Um, and so again, as she became famous, it, it created more of an interest in it as well. And then along comes the Depression, and, the, and tourism falls off. So the Canadian government, again, is like, you know, we have to do something to encourage tourism. So they actually created this little pamphlet. And, and on the cover of it, I, the biggest thing that depicts is the totem pole right in the center of this little pamphlet. And, of course, Mounties and Mooses, which are <laughs> – <laughs> you can't get more Canadian than that, you know. The totem pole, a Mountie, and a Moose, and you're good to go, right? So, right. so that was it. Um, 
But the revival of carving these started really in the 1950s, and it was really in 1951 when the Native Act was finally repealed, the Indian Act, and, and they did away with it. So the Native culture started to rebound a little bit, and there was an artist named Ellen Neal, who was the granddaughter of a man named Charlie James, who was actually her grandfather, a and... Um, he was actually one of the famous carvers of totem poles. And she was ended up being given this little workshop in Vancouver Stanley Park near where their collection of totem poles was. And she was actually began carving and making new totem poles. Um, the University of British Columbia eventually hired her to restore some of their poles, but she decided that she much preferred making her own. And, and so even though she restored one or two for them, it really wasn't her thing. So she convinced them to hire her uncle, uh, Mungo Martin. And he took over the restoration work, and he also started carving some of his own. So it started actually bringing this back as an art form. Um, Martin actually um, was commissioned by the Canadian government to carve poles to commemorate the centennial. And they were erected in prominent locations across Canada. And actually one of them was erected in Windsor Great Park as a gift to Queen Elizabeth. So it actually mm. made it all the way to England, one of the totem poles. Mm. Um, and several were erected in Ottawa, uh, just a stone's throw from the Parliament building. And I'm sure if, if Prime Minister King could look out his window and see all these totem poles staring at him, he probably <laughs> wouldn't, have, wouldn't have been a happy camper, you know, for the <laughs> most part. Um, but it sort of became a part of the culture again. So, um, it, it, and now, of course, we have young natives that really wanted to reclaim their culture. They get really back into to all the different art forms and language and dances and ceremonies. And with the potlatch restored, they could start erecting totem poles again. So mm. it, it, the whole art was revived, basically. So in the end, it was an anthropologist and an artist and a railroad that <laughs> saved the totem poles. <laughs> and <then laughs> otherwise, they would have probably been eliminated and you would never have any more of them. So, And it, they're really amazing if you get to see. I'm sure everybody's seen one. But again, they have these wonderful totem animals and spirit animals carved on them. And they're, they're absolutely stunningly beautiful and, and awe-inspiring, really, which uh, and shows the, the, the esteem to which the natives actually held animal spirits, that it was a very big deal to them. So I thought that was all fascinating, and I, I hope you guys found that interesting, too. So. I, I really was fascinated with the whole different kinds of totems. I never heard about, like, was it called the mortuary totem? That's really very touching, actually. I love that idea. Mm. And I, I am so glad that they were revived. I remember as a kid seeing them in, I don't know, mm -hmm. in school and things like that. They're and so cool. Everybody yeah. identifies with them of all ages, of all cultures. Yeah. And, and honestly, the thing that, that is beautiful about any of the indigenous cultures is the connection to nature. And what I love about um, animal totems in general, whether you work with them through nature and meeting animals in the wild or cards, is they really... Um, connect you to your animal side in a positive way. So there's one of the things about spirituality that I find a little distressing is sometimes it forgets we're human beings that need food, mm -hmm. shelter, love, um, you know, uh, homes. And part of the animal medicine, at least what I understand, is to help us be comfortable here on earth and to accept our life on earth as, as a beautiful and spiritual thing and not to feel like there's something wrong with our animal body and to it's it, the spirit body, the animal body, they're all important. So I've always felt since I've gotten to know a little bit through mine was through the medicine cards by Jamie Sams and also through one of my friends who studied for 10 years with Lakota and she taught me some things from there. Um, what I loved about her, Kristen was um, I was still kind of shy, but we'd be outside and whenever she'd see an animal, she would go up and say, my beautiful being, and she would be so <laughs> expressive. And at first I felt really embarrassed, you know, because she would do it in front of everybody. And she's a white woman, and, and she had so much mm -hmm. love for them. And, and it made me realize, I guess, something about being able to express openly your love for nature mm -hmm. and animals and recognizing them as kin, which is mm -hmm. the meaning of the word totem comes from Ojibwe, which basically means kin, mm -hmm or having kinship uh, with the animals. So they're really, they're not something you own. They're, they're really looked up to a lot of times, like Michael said, they can be teachers, but they can also be mm -hmm. your family. Mm -hmm. And most of us grow up, a lot of us grow up with dogs or cats. And in that way, we say I'm a dog person or a cat. So it goes further than that, of course, but people get that right away. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about the, the animal totems is it, it's mm -hmm. really kids relate to it and mm -hmm. um, business people relate to it. And I really think it's our hope to really reconnect fully to nature and to, in a loving way so that we want to protect it, you mm -hmm. know. So what are, what are your thoughts about totems or do you have any favorite 
animals or stories that you've heard about people with their animal totems? It's interesting. Um, and I remember I went to an animal totem reading with Krista, so if you happen to be in Los Angeles, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> Krista works at Mystic Journey in LA, and uh, she does tarot, but also she, you, you do animal totem readings with, with these yeah. beautiful cards. True. And I, that's one of, when I first met Krista, years, a couple years ago, mm -hmm. she did an animal totem reading with me. And I remember we went through the cards, and you had said that some of them were left for me to discover by myself. Yeah, and that's every system is different. So mm. one of the things you're going to find that um, probably because they come from different tribes and different cultures, and for whatever reason, Jamie Sams, who is a mix of um, Cherokee, Seneca, and French descent, mm -hmm. she uses a system with nine. Right. But two are your main ones that you're meant to discover on your own. And it was interesting because, uh, and I told you this story, I was walking through Hyde Park in London uh, when I was studying there, and a squirrel just literally came up to me. Just literally, it climbed right up my body and went, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and looked right into my face and then went scurried back down. And it's so funny that I've just had this um, affinity for squirrels ever since. And so it's, that's one of those things where you have like a moment and you just all of a sudden connect like kin, like family with an animal and they're and they and they're they're there to teach you something. And I remember looking up squirrels and how joyous they are and how fun they are, but they're also quite serious mm -hmm. um, about when they're when they work, they work. When they play, they play. And um, there are squirrels in my by my house. Um, there are these like two or three squirrels that are constantly like squ squirreling around. And the other day, I saw him have this big nut. Right, he was like, and he was so happy. Like he had this nut like this size in his mouth, and he was scurrying off with that thing. And so I always remember that is one of my favorite animal totem stories. Um, was how I discovered that squirrel is one of my animal totems. And I remember telling you that story, and you were like, "Well, that has to be." And I said, "Is that a, like? Do you think that means that it's animal totem?" You're like, "Yeah, I think it means it's one of your animal totems." Michael has some um, good squirrel stories because he has uh, squirrel is one of his uh, totems too, not a oh, main cool. one, but yeah, Michael yeah. has some. Well, I, I don't know if I remember them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I mean, the squirrel for me is a totem um, and one of my ones. The, the way it kind of manifests through me, I can tell you, is that you'll find money everywhere but in my wallet. I, I squirrel it away, and squirrels know, are known for hiding their nuts all over the place. If you give them a bunch of nuts and you watch, they'll scurry all over the neighborhood, hiding them everywhere, um, but not in one place, just scattered. So if I ever need a couple bucks, all I have to do is dig around our apartment, and sooner or later I'll discover one of my stashes, and that's definitely a squirrel <laughs> medicine for sure. So that, yeah, that's and my I remember we first came out here, and we didn't have much money. And mm -hmm. whenever we'd see a squirrel running along the wire, mm -hmm. we would book a party. <laughs> it was a squirrel. Squirrel can be prosperity mm -hmm. um, as one of its totems, and it was just a very specific thing. And what I notice is when people have a relationship with an animal, they start getting messages in their own way. And and again, just like any other relationship, you the more you spend time. You know, watching, like we feed the squirrels all the time mm -hmm. and we've had a whole generations of squirrels now. Um, the more you just hang out with them, the, hopefully in real life or you study them, you get your own relationships that might be a little different from the readings that um, or the messages you read elsewhere. Absolutely. I bought a hummingbird feeder the other day and uh, was it two months ago or so? I bought a hummingbird candle and some things happened, like some things that I had asked hummingbird for actually happened and hummingbird came and visited me in my in my patio a number of times and right around the time I lit that candle and um and so I just felt you know let me let me feed hummingbird maybe hummingbird will help me out a little bit more if I help out hummingbird it's a two-way street yes you know giving and receiving it's so it's it's uh you, know, you have to kind of keep that in mind with it. With it. It's sort of like, because it's easy to pick a card or do something, oh, isn't that nice? But it really, it is like a relationship. And it's like, you see it with people's pets and their cats and their dogs. It's the same kinship bond family that you have with your cat and your dog. It can be with a lion in in Africa. You could have that, that type of bond. It doesn't have to be present with you. It, it's true, and it really is a relationship. And I think that's really important. And sometimes an animal comes to you to be rescued. So I mm. remember once reading for one of the, the most amazing thing about using the medicine cards, in my experience, it's 
maybe my favorite deck because I started with it, but it really is very magical. So hmm. a woman, I was reading for a woman um, in West Hollywood, and she was from West Hollywood or Hollywood Hills, and she picked the skunk card, and she had been rescuing skunks. Oh, my God. And you would never know. She looked like a particularly just a normal woman in her 40s, and she had managed to, I think she had one skunk, I guess you can somehow de-skunk them, that she kept. And she goes, oh, yeah, I've been doing that for a long time. Wow. So a lot of animals come to you for help, and they don't yes. always stay, but they can stay. And I've had uh, a lot of stories of very unusual things with even insects. And, yeah. oh, my God, there was a guy that came into the Mystic Journey bookstore, had a praying mantis that he had made friends with, and it oh rode God. around on his shoulder. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, it was so cool. And he, it was so <laughs> chill, and he basically adopted it, and was, he has now an Instagram account. I forget the name, but it was so beautiful to see this little praying mantis, and he came over and looked at us, you know, and the guy was so chill about it. And so, wow. you know, to me it's about, it's not about, you know, being the, the big eagle or the wolf, which sometimes people with um, probably a need to look at their egos, they want to always mm -hmm. have these, like, power totems. What's uh, most of the teachings of that I've read is every animal, insect, butterfly mm -hmm. is powerful and useful and has a medicine to offer you mm -hmm. from ant to, you know, lynx. And it's really what is right for you and, and to embrace that. And what's interesting, I have found once you really start learning about them, there are things that I definitely have learned about animals and insects I mm -hmm. never knew that are really interesting and you really want them then, you know, like, yeah. wow, that's a cool trait, you know. So don't be a nervous if a spider is your totem. It's a beautiful totem. It's so totem. funny because, like, after I got into animal totems a couple of years ago, I mean, there's a spider who every now and then just spins this web in my patio. And honestly, like anybody else, you probably, oh, my, I want to get rid of it. Now I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. it, she's weaving. Okay, what is? why is she here? You know what I mean? It's it's reading the signs of life, really. And and if you do believe that everything happens for a reason, or there are signs everywhere, or there are no coin, you know, you it's it's I think it's a a wonderful opportunity to kind of sit back and go, okay, mm -hmm. what is spider telling me? Um, remember when moth came to my shower and just kind of hung out there for a while, and normally I would be like, oh my god, a moth, <laughs> you know what I mean? Who get the and it was interesting because at that particular time in my life, it was bringing in messages, which moth can bring in. Um, and so you get excited to actually see these animals now as opposed to just thinking, oh, that's just a bug, you know, and mm -hmm. let's get rid of it. Now I'm always um, more, and now it, it's different if it's a huge big roach and it's this big and it's crawling. It. <laughs> like I saw at a restaurant the other day and it was that, and you kind of like, oh, get rid of it. But even roach is, if you've got roach as a totem, it's a pretty powerful totem. You'd be to hard have. to destroy. I was gonna say it would be exactly. I mean, you would be just <laughs> the longevity there would be incredible. So like every animal that you have, snail. I remember when snail visited me the first time, and I saw snail the uh, the other day actually, and I thought, okay, it's. I felt like it's a return of something. Let me. When was that last time I saw snail? And it seemed like there was a certain cycle with snail returning. So sometimes, like, you can see animals at certain times. It was really interesting, the um, uh, Wild, that movie that Reese oh, Witherspoon yes. made. That movie had an animal totem, and it was, like, done very poignantly, where she would see a fox, and she saw a fox at the beginning of her journey, and then there was a point, I don't want to ruin the movie, but there was a point where actually... It was quite clear Fox was there protecting her mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the wilderness where it could be quite dangerous for anybody, no less a, a woman to by herself be just wandering around. Um, so it, it was, it's, it's very powerful. And also when you read some of the stories of some of the tribes that are still, you know, alive and authentic, their relationship with animals is extraordinary and I wish I could remember the tribe that has whale as a totem it's not in this area even though I think the indigenous culture here is connected to dolphins they mm. had and still have the ability to call a whale in from the ocean mm. so this is a very deep concept that we have lost some of it but not the people that have kept it going the indigenous cultures that they they really communicate with them and they really have relationships that are, are compassionate and understanding. And it's one of the, the tragedies of how the American 
um, culture developed on top of this beautiful culture. And it's certainly not too late to, you know, heal and mend from the, the travesty against the indigenous people here. But at this, it, 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 it hurts me to think of what this country might have been if, for instance, Benjamin Franklin had thought we should embrace the turkey as our totem and not the eagle, which is brilliant beyond belief because even though the eagle is incredibly spiritual and certain native people understand that, people I think that aren't native think it as a, as a predator, the top predator, which is what America became. They've taken away the spirituality of the eagle. So I don't know how Benjamin Franklin knew that would happen because <laughs> the turkey is connected to um, uh, humility, sacrifice, mothering. It's, it's more, you know, like it's a humble bird. Uh, so humble but fierce. All, all birds have strong will. We've decided that no matter how small they are. So, but there's definitely different like um, cards that you can get to. One of the things I like about the cards are they're really children friendly. And mm -hmm. so I, I once um, met a bunch of children that we did the totems for, and it was the funnest thing I think I've ever done with the totem cards because they're so connected to cool. nature still, and they get so excited about it, and they totally get it. Uh, but certainly, I would say one of the most powerful ways is to see um, what crosses your path in life mm -hmm. and what comes to you, especially at times which could be meaningful for you. And often it can be animals or birds or insects that you really have know nothing about. And they will teach you. So one of the things I, I read once by, I think it's this fellow that does this really beautiful deck. I'll just show you one of the cards. Um, it's like beadwork for the, the totem. Ooh, ooh. And it's, I think it's called White Eagle mm -hmm. um, deck. I forget the full name, but I, I have it just a little, I haven't used it a lot, but I read the beginning of the book and looked through the meanings. And he said one of the reasons why animals are important and is they've been here longer than us and they are comfortable with themselves. So they really do know things that we don't know about living on earth because we're a younger species. Absolutely. And something that I really wanted to say is that we think of animals somehow as a lesser species because we are very complicated as our brains are very developed and yeah, but we're not, they are not a lesser species. And as you pointed mm -hmm. out, they have been here way longer than us in different incarnations. I mean, some of these birds have been around since the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, um, we definitely have something to learn from them if we speak with them. And, and, and don't worry if you're not perfect, because I, I can tell you, I've evolved with even how I perceive animals and insects. And, you know, I feel like from when I was a young woman, even when I liked animals as a kid. I, I think I really did see them as pets. Mm -hmm. And there's no way I see any animal that comes into my life as a pet anymore or even outside. You know, I just feel like you can learn to be more open by just being curious about them. And they do really teach you. That's what's really cool is that it's one of those things that even observation and spending time with the different animals teaches you about them. And that's what's really nice. And um, I think that... Uh, I have a lot of really amazing stories from some of the clients and uh, that I have seen that animals have really helped them make decisions. Uh, one of my favorite stories is a, a woman that uh, is no longer alive. She was a lovely uh, client I had for many, many years, and she had picked the dragonfly. Uh, she was going up to Oregon to purchase a, a house to rent out to people. So mm -hmm. I didn't tell her to do any of this. I just told her what I thought Dragonfly meant at the time, and it was her guide and ally right now. Mm -hmm. She got to the house in a wooded area, and she really liked it. But I guess it was her first purchase, and she wanted to make sure. So she actually asked a Dragonfly if it would appear and confirm that this is a good decision. So she thought it would because it was a wooded area. Nothing happened. She went inside, and there was this beautiful um, chandelier at the top and which uh, dragonfly is associated with light. And from the chandelier, a dragonfly flew and landed on her wrist. Oh my God. And she was so amazed. Um, not only did she buy the house, which worked out very well, but she did this beautiful decoration of a dragonfly in honor of the dragonfly. Aww. And that was yeah. always so touching to me, but how could you make that happen, <laughs> you know? And, and, and dragonflies are not easy to come by. I very rarely yeah. ever see a dragonfly. So that's definitely yeah. a sign. And and um, it goes to show with manifestation, if you really believe, if you really truly believe and say that, 
you know, if this is the right thing, then it's the right thing. If I don't see a dragonfly, I'm not doing it. Um, I'm always really just so um, inspired by people that are like that because I, I know that for me sometimes I'm like if a dragonfly appears and then it doesn't then I or like so I, you know I, it's hard to to keep it up sometimes and it's just like these stories are so inspirational because it reminds me and the more you hear it the more you really have faith in it and I, I have to admit sometimes I forget to ask for help from my mm -hmm. my um, medicine animals and one of my favorites is the moose uh, I never really knew much about the moose, but I did move to Canada, <laughs> and I went, my first hockey game was the moose heads, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I picked that as one of my f uh, seven, it's my number four one, which is your wisdom totem, and I remember once um, we were in, um, I don't know, it was like early on in our career here at the Bodhi Tree, there was a friend of ours that went missing overnight and she's a young woman and we were just worried about her we didn't know where she was and she was having some problems no cell phones so my other friend uh, Simona called me and it was like midnight and I didn't know what to do so I was just gonna go hang out with Simona and talk to her and on the way in I thought for some reason to ask the moose for guidance I didn't I don't know why I even thought I said you know what maybe I'll just ask for some real guidance what should we do is it gonna be okay so I turned on the radio and there was a story about a young moose in Vermont who had become friendly to everyone in town that had gone Aww. missing. Aww. And he showed up like a week later and he was all right. So I knew she was going to be all right. And to Aww. this day, I don't, I sometimes even think I hallucinated that. I mean, I just turned the radio on just to hear music, but it immediately responded. And I was mm -hmm. so floored because, you know, I don't think I'm always the most um, dedicated practitioner what I find with the animals is they seem to act very easily and quickly for everybody. Mm -hmm. If you just have a genuine like concern and you're mm -hmm. just open hearted, you don't have to have any training because guess mm -hmm. what? You're part of nature. Right. And, and we're so, all family. They're our family. Yeah, they're our yeah. family. So I'll never forget that. I'm, I'm in awe of the moose since. <laughs> so Michael, do you have any other favorite animals or animal stories you'd like to share? Um, Gee, let's see. Yes, I, I guess so. Um, of course, the, with familiars, and not just totem animals, but with uh, many magical people, there's uh, familiars. And we've had several of them um, that are definitely magical creatures. But our first was this old kitty named Cabot, and she was a black cat. Um, and we were driving down Venice Boulevard, heading home from somewhere, and we're coming through Mar Vista. And suddenly, uh, I turned to Krista, I said, we have to go to the, the animal shelter. And she's like, why? And I said, I don't know. We have to go to the animal shelter. So we, we drove over to Santa Monica to the animal shelter and uh, walked through the first time we didn't see her. And as we're walking back through, there's this little tiny old black kitty curled up in the corner of this cage, terrified. And, and we knew that she belonged to us. So we, we took her. Um, this other family had showed up that was going to, to ask for her too, but we were there first. Um, and she was not a, a cat that she was very frail. She wouldn't got along with little kids. So I'm really glad that she came to us. And she was this incredibly magical little creature. Um, we think that when she passed away, she was probably 20 years old or more. Um, and in the end, she, she got very arthritic. And her, her day was from the bed to the litter box to her dish and back to bed again, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and so she, she didn't hang out with us very much because she was ill. Um, but what was really cool was that when she was healthy, one day I was laying, I had my medicine bag on my chest and she crawled up on my chest and she actually broke off one of her toenails and gave it to me to put in my bag. So it's still in my little medicine pouch. Um, and then we found her on a full moon and, and as her days were getting short. And at the very end, the last couple of days, she made this incredible effort to come in and spend time with us. And then a, a couple of days later, she, she passed away. Um, and when she passed away, it was on a full moon. So she came to mm -hmm. us on a full moon, and she left on a full moon. And, and so she was definitely a, a pretty magical little creature. She so wasn't. Was and I remember one time in the middle of the night, she wasn't a big crier. Mm -hmm. And one time in the middle of the night, I heard her, and she was sitting in the middle of the floor looking at something going, meow, 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 meow. Wow, 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 wow. It was like a lecture. It was the oddest thing. Like, this is what's going to happen. You're a spirit or something. And she was looking directly at something. And I, I do yeah. think black cats are kind of special myself, even mm -hmm. though, unfortunately, they've been demonized, hunted, killed. They still can be on Halloween. You have to be careful if you have a black cat. Um, yeah. And, it, it, and they're descended from 
uh, Egyptian cats, the Bast. And so they do have a special lineage, I think. Right. And she had these big green luminous eyes and mm -hmm. very sweet thing, very petite, like Michael said. So, but it was odd how Michael just kind of picked up her call for us, you know, wanted to come to a home, I think, where she could have the life she wanted, her retirement right. home. <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh my, I have a cat, too. And it kind of like I wasn't looking for a cat when I got my cat. When I first moved to L.A., um, I was at a Trader Joe's getting my first groceries ever. And I lived in downtown LA. And, um, and so I was at the Los Feliz trailer, Trader Joe's and a little boy came up to me and lifted a cat and went, would you like a kitten? Just like that. And I was like, oh God, I had never, I'd always wanted a cat, but I was kind of afraid. I never had one. And anyway, long story short, I ended up getting this cat and he's just a trip. His name is Yuri, and he's a big cat. Like he, like people have seen him. He's just like, and he's not an overeater. He's just like a big, majestic, gray sort of like um, Mao cat. And but he was born in an alley, you know, somewhere. But it's interesting because I've had a couple of different psychics pick him up on me. Because often ah. when you go to like a medium gallery, if any of you are into that. Um, you've gone to a medium gallery or you've been to a medium or a, a psychic, they've picked him up a bunch of times on me and they'll mm -hmm. say, well, he wants you to know this, he wants you to know that. I've had a couple of people tell me he's my guardian angel. Um, he is he is pretty cool. Um, I call him the Buddha of Venice Beach or the, the Cheshire Cat of Venice Beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he's awesome. Uh, but I did have a medium once that said, you know, your cat was a prostitute in a... <laughs> In in one of his his one of his lives, he was a prostitute, and he and he keeps saying, "Tell my mom I was a hooker. Tell my mom I was a hooker." Like over and over again, <laughs> he was like, "So it's interesting." Um, but they have past lives too. Are are all the animals? You know? Yeah. The, now there's a lot of ways you can um, meet your totem. So again, there's many systems. I personally don't think there's one right way. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first learned about animals, it was the one power animal. And I mm -hmm. went on a shamanic journey, which was really great mm -hmm. and had a really interesting and, and powerful experience. And I still really like what I learned from that journey. And for me, I like the complexity of the concept of having nine totems with different parts of you Mm -hmm. represented different time frames because I think first of all we're complex people and secondly it's a very clever way to get you to love all of nature because mm -hmm. what's interesting is let's say you have you know Al as a totem then you also can look at in a relationship Al's prey so you have relationship with rabbit so you start looking, then you can also look at a symbiotic relationships. For instance, wolf and raven, they hunt together. Mm -hmm. So what happens is your, your nine totems become easily 18, which <laughs> keep expanding into more. And of course, some yeah. animals or insects have more than one prey. And I think it's a very clever way to teach us to embrace all of nature. Having said that, if I was a therapist, by like a traditional therapist, I would use the totem method to help people embrace their shadows. So my one yes. experience, I remember this woman picked her seven totems with me and they were all super aggressive animals. And she said she had a lot of trouble with anger. Wow. And I said, well, no, you don't. You're, you just have aggressive energy. So what you need to do is accept that and work with it in a meaningful and conscious way instead of being something you're not. Mm -hmm. So what I found by the time I found the totems, especially moose. Moose can help you with self-esteem. And I, I mm -hmm. really struggled a lot with self-esteem from a very young age. But once I met moose, something shifted for me mm -hmm. around that area. And Michael bought me this huge stuffed moose. We called him Bruce the Moose. I still have him. And I used to just <laughs> put him in my bed at night because your subconscious it understands images and symbols and you can make it really playful and it actually works it starts getting in your subconscious that, okay, I can have a balanced self-esteem. This is what moose is about. This is my medicine. Mm -hmm. These are the things mm -hmm. moose will help me to do. And I found it really helped me just that last extra step to really have normal self-esteem. And to really, on top of it, moose has uncanny intuition to trust my intuition because mine is, 
I have no sensation. I don't have visions. I don't, I just know something. And mm-hmm. you kind of think, well, that's boring. And it's not, it's just a different way of having intuition. Absolutely. So. I was having a discussion with a friend of mine who does sound baths here in, in Venice Beach a lot. And she was saying, and you know, I'm a Taurus and she's a Capricorn. And we were just talking about how we're, we are kind of grounded on earth very often. And so our intuitions are very great. Like I feel things in my body where she'll be like, you know, I'll do a sound bath and people will say, I, I was traveling through the astral pain, plane, talking to light beings and seeing unicorns. And I, I mean, I love to do breath work meditation and highly recommend it. But people, I remember I used to go to this one woman and she would do a different theme and it would be an angel or a unicorn or a deer. And people would be like, and I met my unicorn. And he said, that, and I was like, I, you know, I, I, you know, very similar. And so it doesn't have to be this big grand thing. It could literally be something that you feel in the body, which is fantastic with, to work with animal totem because they are grounded here. They're, they're here on earth with us. They are, they're not angelic beings. They are earthly beings. Yes. And that, that's one of the differences I have found between the concept of a familiar, at least the old con, the concept and a totem. Familiars in the Middle Ages were often spiritual uh, beings, including people, not just animals. They could morph into animals that witches would use, and Mm -hmm. they would work their magic for them. So they were kind of hired by witches in a sense, and often in in negative ways. You know, that's Mm -hmm. why they'd have these, but they were often in spirit form, whereas my understanding of totem is they're usually real live creatures right and they're not mystical or mythical which is uh, fine to have a mythical animal guide and what i like about the real animal maybe because i i'm a cancerian and i want to mother things i don't know is is that you have that real connection but it can get also quite profound spiritually so i often will have my dove comes in my dreams a lot you know Mm. and yet she's a real live dove so to me, um, there's something beautiful and healing about the real, uh, the totems, though even the familiar has kind of morphed a little into more like, a, you know, animal guides and things like that. And again, there's no right or wrong way to any of this. But I personally love um, the, the magic of seeing coming across your totem in the wild, especially when yeah. you're not expecting it. And, yeah. and everyone always gets so excited about it, you know, yeah. like... I've had an affinity for tigers my whole life since I was, I mean, I, I was so young, I can't even remember, like five years old. I just always loved them. And so I consider it like my, you know, one of my animals, even though, you know, um, there's really no reason for it. I didn't pull an animal car. I just simply have always felt drawn. And sometimes you feel drawn to um, certain things. I, I have an aunt who says uh, dolphins are the love animal of her and mm. her husband. And, and I'm, I, I can't remember quite the story, but they have dolphins kind of in their home. And mm-hmm. it's maybe, I think, because they might have gone on some vacation and they bonded and there was a, a dolphin. I'm not altogether sure, but they, it's, it's interesting because, like, now when she looks at any kind of a dolphin or she'll have, like, dolphin earrings or different things, it reminds me of how much she loves her husband. You know, oh, it's sweet. Yeah, yeah. No, they, so. And they really are medicine. And, and when I tell people um, in the readings, uh, they'll pick usually a card in a reading at the end of a reading, I, all of my tarot readings. And I, you have to take the medicine, though. That means mm. that either you are supposed to take the advice the animal gives. So if possum tells you to lay low, lay low. <laughs> it works. Yeah. And if you don't believe it, what I have found, I've even done things where I thought, really, that's going to work? And it did. And so it's really humbled me to think my you know, intellectual human side always knows best, and it doesn't. Uh, the other funny thing I remember once that because I always have everyone pick an animal card just for fun Mm -hmm. um, there was a man I used to read for a lot a businessman he was really intense really into astrology and really really smart Mm -hmm. and he would pick his animal cards he'd never ever say anything about it he never came back and told me finally one day after many years said you know what I don't think he likes these I'm not going to have him pick one so I skipped it. And of course he goes, well, where's my animal card? Aww. And that really taught me. I was like, wow, he really, he just didn't want to, for some reason, acknowledge it. or it was and, Maybe it was something private within yeah. himself that was, he just kind of took that in. And, yeah. And it's a wonderful, anybody who does read tarot or oracle, including the animal cards, it's just a brilliant thing to do to really um, bring a depth into a, a reading. You know, I mean, that's my experience of it. 
It's true. And actually, I mean, I owe so much to the medicine cards because it began my, my journey. It began, my friend had this deck. Here's the deck and I'll, here's Swan, which is a really wonderful totem. Um, she had it on her coffee table mm -hmm. and I'd always pick a, a card for the day. My friend who studied with Lakota. And so I liked that. And then when I first started doing readings, Michael knew the tarot, but I didn't know the tarot yet, but I knew the animal cards. So I would right. do one reading for us would be both of us doing the reading side by side. So I would do the pathway spread from the medicine cards and How Michael cool. would do the tarot. And then when I was learning the tarot, I would put um, the medicine cards on top of the tarot, which I got the idea from Ravenwood's book of yes. using them to help me understand the meaning of the cards. Right. You know, to make it a little easier to learn. And, and it really helped. And it's wonderful, actually, that when you have tarot, sometimes to clarify with a couple of animal cards or even putting an animal card on top, there's just, I don't know, I think we talk a lot on this channel about there doesn't have to be any rules or any structure to any of the magic or inspirations mm -hmm. that you want to do. And, I mean, animal animal decks are just pretty. And there are so many beautiful ones out there. Um, Absolutely, there are. And, 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 you know, the only thing I would say is uh, when you go to look at the book, I have seen a few books that aren't quite as good with the interpretation. So I really highly recommend always having a copy of Ted Andrews' Animal Speak. Yeah. Because, and then also, I mean, the Medicine Cards book is really beautiful too, but I've read a couple that really seem off, like really made up weird things about animals. And I'm like, really? The pelican is selfishness? And I was like, no, it's associated with Christ normally and sacrifice. So I read that in one book where a right. woman had channeled the meanings. I thought, oh, please, you know. Right, 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 uh, right. Know, please and don't channel meanings of animals because it's really insulting to all the cultures that have literally studied and learn from nature I, I don't get that part at all but I mean you can like understand what it is and then channel around that oh sure but to, yeah no it's tough I mean there's um uh sometimes uh, there's, there's a specific animal card I, I don't want to say what it is out loud because so many people love it um but it seems to me like she's sort of kind of based on her artwork seems to be interpreting it as opposed to what it really is and it can be very confusing because you'll, and I, I mean, anytime you're doing oracle work, it's always about what's coming from you. Again, I'm a rule breaker. I get it. But again, like you said, there are just so many cultures that have been trying to teach us for thousands of years about these animals and, and, and their medicine. Um, it would be like saying owl is not wise. It's, it's. Something well, and also, it's different. really based a lot on, on observation. Many right. years, remember that, you know, most of us used to live in nature more, and we would observe. So the traits are really connected. And you right. really, like, for instance, the dove. Now, I've always known the dove was considered to be a bird of peace and love. Having a dove with me, she is the most gentle, forgiving, loving little bird and it makes your heart melt to be around her you can easily see why this little dove is associated with love mm -hmm. there is a reason so it's that's why i mean with the tarot in a sense you probably could make something up there aren't any but animals are based on real animals doing mm -hmm. real things and of course we're still yeah. learning but what was interesting many many cultures came up with the same ideas right in different countries because of the observations. The observations. And that's what's insulting. It's, it's like, it's, it's like yeah. scientific meets metaphysics very yeah. much in it. Absolutely. It's based on real things. You know, the the moose um, likes to sometimes be alone. Um, it uh, It's associated with, um, what, what else? Uh, uh, intuition. And mm -hmm. I was trying to think of something else about the moose. Oh, it, the old warrior. So mm -hmm. the, if you pick the moose, it, it can be about battles, but you're meant to see it more as like, I am the old warrior and I fought many battles. I don't have to go and fight everything. I can use diplomacy. Well, a moose in battle, I mean, can you imagine what that would be like? And probably moose, mm -hmm. they're so big, they don't have to prove themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of these, these traits are really like possum playing dead. They really do know how to play dead. They even smell like death and that's how they survive. Mm -hmm. So... These are. This is why it's incorrect because it's based on something real. Whereas I think if you maybe had a unicorn, I don't know. You probably could go a little more with the interpretation because it's mythological, right? And you'd look at how unicorn appears in different fairy tales and right. cultures, and, and that's all wonderful. It just it's not animal totem. Yes, it's not. 
And, and, and like I said, it's also quite insulting to the thousands of years people have spent looking and spending time with them. And, and I, I think we should learn to appreciate lineages a little bit more. Uh, at least Americans have a little trouble with that. <laughs> we're not great with history. <laughs> you know, not even not our own history, we're not very good with. So, but that's, uh, like I said, uh, I think that it's one of those things anybody can relate to. As I said, even children. So if you wanted to introduce a deck to a, a young child that's very safe and really fun and effective, by the way, I think any kind of animal deck would be I have be an really animal great. deck when I was student teaching that I used to bring in and I was trying to like squeeze it into the school day somehow. It's very difficult and it's so structured. Um, but it, it, you, you can make up little lessons with your animal cards with your kids. Um, as a matter of fact, it's Stephen... Farmer. Ted, Stephen Farmer mm -hmm. had the animal, um, the chil it's, it's a special children's animal ah. deck. And it actually comes with little environmental lessons huh. and little like emotional lessons with each so that you can kind of talk about the environment, about planet Earth, about how they're feeling. You know, I'm like, these are great for adults too. They have, you know, and that's a really good point about the environment. So if you have like your two main totems, if you're uh, an animal that likes the woods a lot, you're going to be happy living around wooded areas. And so one of the things I've learned is adapting your life around your totem will make you happier on earth. So for instance, uh, if you have a lot of water animals or, you know, whale, dolphin, octopus, um, being by the ocean or lakes can be very important for you. And these are very simple things that are easy to find out about. So the habitat, also food, uh, Michael loves peanut butter sandwiches. It's so interesting because when you think of animals that adapt into cities as well as the country, so if you have a lot of animals or a, a number of animals in, in your totem that uh, are adaptable, that could maybe talk about why you prefer to be in a city or why you kind of mm -hmm. need some time in the country. You live in the city, but you've got to get some time in the country sometime. It can, mm -hmm. Actually, it's, a very, it's very, very insightful. Yeah, and, and like if you're a herd animal, like I, I've met people that join so many groups and they must have a herd energy. Mm -hmm. And then there's like the heron that would need some time alone more, you know, right. away from people. Right. So it's Great really... for relationships too. Yes. Because I always get tarot card readings for relationships and Krista always has me pick advice on, on love advice or how to deal with the person or, how, you know, advice on how to approach them, how to deal with them separately or with your when you're with them it really works oh it's great um i remember uh, i've had trouble with one of my neighbors and um sometimes i just want to go battle and one day i went home at night and there were two possums <laughs> and i thought okay lay low and it kind of went away and subsided i was about to make it much worse but seeing the two and they were you know, right, right by my window, walking by. It was kind of strange to see two of them. I was going to say, um, <laughs> I'd be a little freaked out, actually, if I saw two of them. Oh, I love the possum. We, we have a lot of possums by our yeah. house, and they, they are really cool. Yeah. So they've helped me several times to stay chill, you know, even though, again, they're actually not one of my main totems. But when I see them, I pay attention. I think, oh, yeah. is there something I need to? Now, not always every, not every animal is a message. <laughs> you know, not everything is a message, even though it has to feel like, but no. if, you, if you get a kind of a gut instinct, if you get that little feeling, that little inkling, then, then it means something. And I think part of what this channel is about and, and our journey is about is trusting that inkling, that little thing yes. that you feel. And like knowing when it's just something, okay, that's a bird flying by. And when it's like, oh, okay, yeah. That's the same, exact same color bird I saw when this thing, and then you get reminded by it, it triggers something. Okay, that's something that you pay attention to. And so it's so much fun. The other thing that's really fun to do is try to guess someone's animal by how they look. <laughs> and um, so, for instance, people that have a predator, predatory bird will often have a distinctive nose and their eyes can be really sharp and bright. I'll never forget it. And then uh, sometimes Michael and I are watching TV and what do you think his animal is, you know? <laughs> and, and often if you're a little stumped about one of your main totems, ask one of your friends. They'll say, oh my God, you're just like a snake, you know? And that's so, uh, it's just like a yeah. snake. I, I, they're cool. <laughs> but that's very interesting too if you are kind of dating someone or you're questioning a certain friendship and they kind of remind you of a certain animal. Look up that animal. It might give you some hints on them, some advice on how to 
work things out or cut them off, maybe. I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> That's true. Some animals don't get along. <laughs> well, continuing nature, we're going to be talking about plant medicine next time. So you've got to join us for that one. Yes. Please hit the subscribe button if you want to hear more. Give us a thumbs up because we really would love that. Please comment. We love to hear from you. Join the fam. We'll see you next time. Enjoy the magic. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye.